the scenes are fast. So you barely see them, but they're all very beautiful. But again, I was hoping for some Salma Hayek boobage like you get in uh, Desperado. There's none of that. We also didn't get to see Gloria, the bank teller naked, which is kind of a bummer. <laughs> oh, maybe that's in the, the uh, director's cut. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we love and growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm one of your three co-hosts, Roger Roper. And alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And Gene Sex Machine Lions. Okay, ramblers, let's get rambling. And each week, the audience selects from six movie choices that we then break out our race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of each podcast, the three of us will provide you, the audience, the number of wipes this movie would take to get off your respective butt. So thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. You can also check out our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and True Detective. That being said, Big D, it's still, again, if you've been listening, if you're a listener of Shat the Movies, you've known over the last few weeks, ever since we returned from Game of Thrones, we've been clearing out all of our commissions that we've received. But the commissions keep coming in, Big D. They keep coming. They keep piling in. Why are people paying for this podcast? This is quality entertainment. You kidding me? This is terrible. Yeah. So we've burned through you know, most of our reserve, and now we've just gotten a bunch of uh, new ones. So uh, if there's a movie you want to see or you voted on some categories you were hoping to see, that might come around in October. So you better just get to the front of the line. Uh, send us an email and tell us what you'd like to commission. And to everyone who commissions a movie, we appreciate it. Uh, but this week, we have a good, good movie. And it's a string of about four weeks that are strong movies. Uh, and this one was uh, commissioned by one of our longtime listeners, Christian DeLeo. And he did the 1996 classic from Dust Till Dawn. And Big D, this is Christian's second commission for Shat the Movies. And he writes, Shat Crew, back for another commission. And I decided for my second time around to choose the one film that blew my mind the most as a young boy. Not Fight Club, not The Usual Suspects, not The Crying Game, but 1996's From Dust Till Dawn. I first stumbled upon this masterpiece on late night TV in the mid 2000s when I was flipping through channels and saw Quentin Tarantino acting in a movie. I was caught off guard because as a young film connoisseur, I've seen every single movie that he had written and directed at the time, but never knew he acted in anything other than his brief appearances in Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. I thought I was in for a dark crime thriller with Tarantino <laughs> and Clooney as captors of Harvey Keitel and his family, but I wish I had seen the look on my own face when they cross the border into Mexico and the film pulls a complete genre switch as they hold in a bar named the titty twister. I remember yelling out what in the actual fuck at my television, <laughs> but was completely enthralled by the remaining runtime of the film. I urge anyone who hasn't seen this film to go in completely blind. I think we're going to ruin that Christian yeah. because it is 100% the best way to view it. As for the film itself, it's a one wipe for me. It's got everything, over-the-top violence, a dark sense of humor, colorful characters, Salma Hayek in her prime, and it is extremely quotable. Cheech Marin's description of different types of pussy offered at the titty twister comes to mind. This movie is a complete blast, and I'm excited to hear you guys talk about this one. Cheers. P.S. I am one of four Roger fans, and I miss him dearly. That's uh, that's three more fans than I than I ever thought that I would have. <laughs> I, do you ever think that like so at the end of our podcast that we did what we, we just a galaxy quest right at the end of it you guys started riffing on all the cheech marin quotes about the pussy do you think we lost listeners do you think people got to the end and they were like oh how disgusting and without like zero context like they had never heard of this movie so they didn't know what we were doing 
I mean, I think anybody who listens to this podcast uh, either has seen Dust Till Dawn or something far more graphic that we've covered. So if you've okay. seen Game of Thrones, Westworld, uh, <laughs> True Detective, you're well prepared yeah. uh, for this movie. I thought it was really interesting that Christian asked that people go in completely blind. I didn't even think to offer that caveat to the viewer. Guys, if you haven't seen this movie, do watch it first yeah, because yeah. we're going to spoil it completely. Yeah, it. I mean, this movie is bad. We, we're we're going to play the trailer here in just a second, but I really feel like the the marketing for this movie did it a disservice. How amazing would it have been had they just marketed the movie as this crime thriller with these two lunatics, and then when people went to see the movie, and then Hold it just on. completely turns into this. Oh, it would have been amazing. Okay, so not that we're going to jump too far ahead here, but you would want to go see Reservoir Dogs and that they didn't tell you there were werewolves. So with the final <laughs> yes. scene when they're in the warehouse and, you know, the cop is tied up exactly. and they start playing Little Green Bag, then the werewolves come out. You'd be like, what the fuck is what this? So no, fuck is happening here? You, you have to have supernatural creatures in the trailers or it's false advertising. Right. If there are, in fact, supernatural creatures in this <laughs> if movie, there are, which yes. we're not saying there are, but there might be. From Dust Till Dawn is a 1996 American action horror film directed by Robert Rodriguez and written by Quentin Tarantino. It stars Harvey Keitel, George Clooney, Tarantino, and Juliette Lewis. After enjoying financial success at the box office, it has since gone on to become a cult classic. From Dust Till Dawn was followed by two direct-to-video prequels. Well, one was a prequel, one was a direct sequel. The first one was a direct sequel called From Dust Till Dawn 2, Texas Blood Money. And then the prequel was from Dust Till Dawn 3, The Hangman's Daughter. They were both received poorly by critics. I challenge that because I believe from Dust Till Dawn 3 is actually pretty good. Danny Trejo is the only actor to appear in all three, although Michael Parks appears in both from Dust Till Dawn and The Hangman's Daughter. Rodriguez, Tarantino, and Lawrence Bender, all three served as producers of those movies. In late 2010, it was reported that a possible fourth film in the series may be produced but in 2012, those plans were still on hold. The movie did win some awards, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. George Clooney won an MTV Movie and TV <laughs> Award in 1996 for Best Breakthrough Performance. And Quentin Tarantino was nominated for a Razzie Award in 1997 for Worst Supporting Actor. Tarantino pitched George Clooney on the film after directing him in an episode of ER? Yeah. What? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Tarantino did an no. ER episode? Yeah. Bloodiest one ever. And from Dust Till Dawn marked George Clooney's first starring role in a major Hollywood film. We always ask the question, where were you? What are your first memories of from Dust Till Dawn? We'll start with you, Big D. Well, this is a, a sad memory for me. Uh, it was the end of my relationship with my longtime college girlfriend. Uh, and What was her name? Joe Lynn. Name her. What was her last name? I'm not going to give her last. Joe Lynn H. And she's from Inwood, New York. You think she listens to the podcast? Fuck no. No chance. <laughs> Fuck no. But somebody might know her. I mean, Joe Lynn's kind of an odd name, but right. uh, this was towards the end of our relationship. I remember things were rocky. Let's. I said, let's go to a movie. Somehow this movie was chosen, <laughs> which I don't think really helped the relationship. Su su surprising the relationship ended. But it was one of those where we're sitting in the theater, you know, it's awkward, there's tension. So sadly, I didn't get a chance to completely enjoy this movie the first time through. Subsequently watched it on video and then fell in love with it. But that first time was sad and I'm having those memories today. Now, Gene, you first starred on the podcast, I think, what, episode four, right? We did a Halloween spooky <laughs> coverage of uh it was a spooky it was a spooktacular it was a halloween shot the movie spooktacular with uh the lost boys so we know that you're a vampire connoisseur so you must have seen this movie at a young age i mean as far as i'm concerned this podcast didn't start till i was on it oh. so it was really episode one the other ones were prequels <laughs> to this podcast uh but yeah raj this was like the confluence of all roads of my life leading to this one movie I was a 16-year-old goth kid. I already worshipped Reservoir Dogs. Pulp Fiction was my favorite movie at the time. And then I also had seen uh, El Mariachi and Desperado, which I 
loved dearly. And so I was like, holy shit, like this is the coolest movie idea ever. And so the first time I saw uh, the Dust Till Dawn trailer, like my head exploded. And this is one of a handful of films I saw multiple times in theaters. I'm not the kind of person who watches a movie over and over and over again. I was uh, really worried that the effects and style points and acting wouldn't hold up just because it is so stylistic. It is so specific to an era. And so it was very instructional to watch this again as an adult in 2019 uh, and see it from a completely different lens. Yeah. I mean, I, I too, I, so I, you guys both saw it in the, in the movies, in the, in the theaters. I, um, I didn't see it in the theaters. I, I rented this movie. This was a blockbuster night for me because at the time I really loved Tarantino and I, and, and Rodriguez's movies that you mentioned there, El, El Mariachi and Desperado. And I thought I would be cool by proxy if I would continue to watch these type of movies, um, this was also my first introduction to George Clooney. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, he's going to be a great Batman. Just based on this, act, I was I was really jazzed for Batman and Robin as a result of this movie. Is that what your inside voice sounds like? It does. It does. <laughs> it that does. does. Oh, he's going to be a great Batman. He's going to be a great Batman. I have a lot of voices that talk to me. If you've ever seen the show Legion, that's what's going on in my head. Um I also remember pleasuring myself a lot to Salma Hayek in the mid to late nineties. I don't know why I, I admit that, but that's also the voices that are spinning in my head. Well, I know. I think we all did. And what's weird about it is she doesn't get naked in this. Oh, she doesn't need no, to. I, I completely thought she gets naked in this oh, movie. Wait, I, hey, hold, at least top hold that. Hold that. It's, all oof. right. All right. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Well, if you've never listened to the podcast, we're going to break down every plot point for you and talk about it in detail. But again, there's very few movies that we recommend you stop and go watch it and then listen to the podcast. This is one of those movies. If you have never seen from dusk till dawn, you're going to be doing yourself a disservice because this movie is bonkers. But with that being said, now's your time to do that because big D you're going to play that trip. Everybody be cool. You be cool somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Low profile. You understand the meaning of the words? Profile. Sure. Two of America's most dangerous criminals have taken hostages. What is this? It's called a punch. I want to ask you one question, and all I want is a yes or no answer. Do you want to live through this? Yes. Okay, ramblers, let's get rambling. One night is all that stands between them and freedom. This is my kind of place. But it's going to be one hell of a night. We might be in trouble. We have a bunch of fucking vampires out there trying to get in here and suck our fucking blood. Now, their only chance is to fight back. Oh, yeah! George Clooney, Quentin Tarantino, Juliet Lewis. Welcome to slavery. No thanks. I already had a wife. From dusk till dawn. Fugitive brother bank robbers Seth and Richie Gecko hold up a liquor store somewhere in Texas, killing clerk Pete Bottoms and Texas Ranger Earl McGraw. While in the process, they inadvertently destroy the building and at the motel room where they're hiding out, Seth returns to find Richie has raped and murdered a bank clerk they had taken hostage from a previous bank heist. So for, first thing I want to address is something that we've never talked about, but I get tons of emails. The trailer. Usually we don't listen to the trailer before we start recording. I added in post at the end. So we've had people write in how multiple movies have used the alien music the dun 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 dun, dun. It, it's in this trailer as well so yes you don't have to write in we know it's in there we know that they continue using it in multiple movies mm -hmm. i don't know why you would do it with something that's so iconic but uh, we're aware of it and it doesn't really affect the movie but i always fast forward through the trailer anyway so i actually don't know that thanks for writing in everybody yeah, yeah thanks thanks for <laughs> 
Uh, but the movie starts off. This is obviously Tarantino's writing. He wrote the script and Rodriguez directed. The opening scene in the convenience store, it's, it's typical Tarantino. It's great. But uh, I've started to realize that the direction portion doesn't really matter. I think as long as Tarantino has written the script, you can have someone else direct it and it could be quality. But I don't think it can be the reverse. I completely disagree with you, Big D, on this one. And this is one of those rare points in the podcast where I'm just going to say, nope, nope, nope. Robert Rodriguez is a competent director, but Tarantino's writing isn't enough to save him. His style isn't as timeless as Tarantino's. Tarantino makes movies that last forever, and they always look current. Uh, Pulp Fiction came two years before Dust Till Dawn. And that's the movie that really propelled Tarantino into the mainstream. And then Desperado came out a year before Dust Till Dawn. And that's what propelled Robert Rodriguez into the American mainstream. He also did El Mariachi in 1992, which was a low budget masterpiece. But this movie feels decidedly dated. The outfits, uh, the music, the visual effects, the way it's shot, it feels like a campy 90s movie. And there's no way to get around it. But that's what I think Robert Rodriguez was going for. I think he was going for camp. I think both he and Tarantino were going for camp, and I think they effectively did that. Um, I Unfortunately, I'm going to have to disagree with both of you. I think the first half of this movie is timeless, and I think it's one of the best Tarantino scripts. Now, the second half, I will agree with you. It does get very campy and over-the-top and almost cartoonish, but I think that's what they were going for like the the shot of the bank teller in the trunk like you don't even know that there's someone there until they pan down and then they kind of show like the x-ray vision into it like what other movie can get away with that but then they do little subtle things like the backing into the parking spot for a quick getaway little things like that make me happy when they pay the attention to these details and really make these characters seem real and and brought to life and in a way that I I love in movies like this. I think the big difference, though, between a Tarantino and a Rodriguez film is Tarantino's protagonists or even his action stars tend to be like self-deprecating in a way. Sure. So when you look at like, say, uh, say, if you look at like uh, Jules and Vincent in in Pulp Fiction, right, when they end up in Mm -hmm. like the banana slugs T-shirt and like, you know, like they look goofy. Whereas Rodriguez always tries to make these guys look like cool. And those outfits are like so 90s awful. They got like the the blazer with the white shirt and that fucking awful tribal tattoo up the next. <laughs> yeah. And like the car's got to be cool. It's like, oh, look at this tough car they're driving. It's so cool. It's, it Ugh. is. It's definitely Texas, Texas cool. Or Rob, Robert Rodriguez is like he's known for that. that te- but I think it's over the top. It's over the top. It's campy. But I didn't know that Robert Kurtzman is actually credited with the story and his uh, makeup studio. He partners with Greg Nicotero of the walking dead fame. So Kurtzman and Nicotero have collaborated on many major Hollywood movies from a special effect perspective, which is crazy because when you look at the special effects at at the end, the creature design is probably the one thing that doesn't hold up. No, we'll get to the special effects, and there's problems with that. But the major problem with this movie is Ernest Liu. He plays Scott Fuller. Oh, come Fuller. on. How did this uh, kid get a role? This was his first acting role. Right. He had to have known somebody. Was this something where they got backing because you paid to have a, a family member in the movie? He's awful. And you want to know what? It's a surprise. Guess what, guys? He only did a couple more movies and then stopped acting. I take Ernest Liu any day over Quentin Tarantino or Juliette Lewis. Juliette Lewis acts like she's struggling to read lines off of a cue card that's very, very far away. Daddy, what am I (laughs) supposed to do now? And Tarantino overacts in every fucking cameo he makes. He should never get this much screen time. I disagree (laughs) with Tarantino. And maybe it's because that if I ever was so fortunate to be part of a, a major Hollywood production or have some sort of cameo, I would totally overact like Tarantino would. I I like Tarantino. I think he's interesting when he's on screen. I think he does a fantastic job of playing 
this creepy psychotic individual. I think he's great in Pulp Fiction. I think he's great in uh, <laughs> n- what, what's the what's the hotel movie? The four, not four, four rooms. rooms. Yeah, four yes, rooms. It's four rooms. Yeah, it's. I think he's great in four rooms. I like Tarantino. You you cannot compare. And I don't care what you say. You're crazy. Ernest Lou looks like he didn't know they were filming a movie where he's sitting there playing the guitar and he's surprised when they walk in there. He's like, what's going on? Half the time he doesn't know what's going on. He is awful. He's the worst part of the movie. Big D, I hate to break this to you, but in about 10 years, you're going to realize that your daughter is going to act exactly like that. That is what teenagers and preteens act like. They're just ambivalent to every fucking thing that's going on around them. So I have I have an Asian adopted sister and the entire day today, Big D is messaging me. He's like, he's like, do you do you like do you like Ernest Liu? Did you like his character? (laughs) Did you identify with him? Because you have a you have an adopted Asian sibling as well. It was like really it was it was on the verge of like, wow, (sighs) like you are you are a terrible human being. But yes, I did identify with that character because of that. Yeah, I mean, it sounds to me like that put together with my observation. It might just be that Big D doesn't like young Asian actors. I think that's it. I, I have yet to hear you actually praise a young Asian actor on this podcast. In fact, Big D, can you name one young Asian actor that you like? Uh, short round. Yeah, the kids played short round. <laughs> You're just keep saying going, keep that. Going, keep going. <laughs> Run, Raj. Run. <laughs> Well, Pastor Jacob Fuller is on vacation with his children, Scott and Kate. They are kidnapped by the geckos who force the Fullers to smuggle them over the Mexican border in Mexico. They arrive at the Titty Twister, a strip club in the desert where the geckos will be met by their contact Carlos at dawn. Carlos will escort them to Sanctuary at El Rey, a place of safety for fugitives from justice whose admission fee is 30% of everything they have. When Richie complains to Seth that this is too high, Seth tells him it is non-negotiable. So when they go into the titty twister, the bartender says, you guys can't be in here. This is for truck drivers and bikers. The reason why they have that criteria is they want a clientele that no one will miss. If they get killed, truck dumped in a hole, no family's going to come looking for him. That's what they're they're counting on. So when this family rolls in, they don't know what to think. But as a trap, the titty twister, it is fucking perfect. You got the neon lights. You got flamethrowers shooting flames into the night. Uh, any truck driver, I think, or biker from miles, you'd have to stop there. This is like a giant uh, bug light for humans, and especially bikers, uh, truck drivers, or any single man would have to stop there. Have you ever been attracted by a roadside uh, attraction and you actually had to stop? Like you've driven, yeah. you've, you've lived in some pretty remote locations on bases. Um, you've done a lot of road trips. Gene, you've done the same thing. Have either of you been attracted like a moth to a flame such as the titty twister? And, and what were your experiences? Yeah, Raj, I admittedly have been tempted by many a lion's den on the side of the road, (laughs) but uh, I never have, except for, I guess, the dinosaurs on the way from Arizona to California, Uh, the dinosaurs from Pee-wee's Big Adventure, I have stopped there. We stopped there together, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we rode a dinosaur together. We rode like a brontosaurus, yeah. Shirtless. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, the one time that I stopped that I really regretted was I was on a bus uh, that a bunch of moped kids from Grand Rapids... (laughs) had taken to San Francisco. And what you do is, here's the trick, is that if you take a bus and you take all the seats out, it's mm-hmm. not you don't need a bus driving license if there's only the bus driver's seat, right? Basically, to be a commercial vehicle in certain states, it just matters how many seats you have in the vehicle. So what they did was they tore all the seats out and they put sofas in there instead, and those don't mm. count. So we're hanging out on this sofa bus uh, going to San Francisco, and everyone really had to go to the bathroom very badly. We needed some gas and somewhere along the way, we stopped at this roadside like gas station with all the lights off, except for one like little reading light behind the clerk's table, like counter. So we go in there, it's unlocked. There's nobody there. We go, we use the bathroom, we grab some snacks, but none of the like refrigeration areas were lit up. It was just dark. So you had to like fumble around in there to find your snacks that you wanted and like beverages. And then we just left the money on the counter and took off. And in hindsight, I'm pretty sure we could have all died there. Yeah. Somebody definitely killed the cashier. Yeah. 
and they probably found all your fingerprints, the bus tracks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there's, like, there's some mystery out there, some unsolved case. You have a uh, my cousin Vinny situation going on. Well, I think it would be I think it would be great about it is if the cops did show up to dust for prints because the bus had no heat on it and this was the winter. Oh. We, we all had gloves and were bundled up. Oh, okay. So they'd be like these criminal masterminds. <laughs> <laughs> all they left was some strange two stroke oil. It's our only clue. Big D, you just came back from Seattle where you witnessed a lot of these moped gangs in person. Uh, have you also been uh, part of a moped gang yourself that stopped at a roadside attraction where a clerk may have died? Just to touch on the mopeds quick. That's the most embarrassing thing I've ever, <laughs> I've ever seen. It wasn't just a moped gang, but they tweaked the mufflers. So it's me, me. It sounded like a model airplane and they're trying to do donuts. It was embarrassing. Don't don't do it. But yes, the only place I've ever been tempted to stop and did stop was south of the border driving from new york to florida oh god any east coast uh is it still there other than that i imagine it's still there right i imagine i've been driven that since i was in college but you describe it describe if you drive that 95 corridor from new york to florida you see signs for this place like it, it's like the only thing that you're seeing right and you think to yourself it's going to be crazy like to market like three states away and once you get there, it's on both sides of 95. And it's probably, oh man, I, I couldn't even imagine, two, 300 yards of, of bullshit tchotchkes, oh, uh, shitty food, it's so uh, sombreros, bad. bad tequila. A mini golf and course. You have to stop. You have to stop normally because there's nothing else for miles. And that could probably be your last bathroom stop. But if you ever need to go get some cheap tequila, a sombrero, and maybe uh, some, some mariachis or the, uh, what they, the, Maracas. Like, maracas. Maracas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you need Those some are maracas, castanets that you yeah, use. A, a, a castanet is this. A maraca is this. Which are the clams? The that's, 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 a castanet. that's a castanet. Oh, okay. A maraca good, 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 good. you shake. It looks yeah. like a drumstick. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> like a drumstick, the food, not a drumstick uh -huh. gotcha. in musical gotcha. instrument. Right. Gotcha. Well, I, I, so in Arizona, there's a there's an army base down near the border, about an hour and a half south of Tucson. Is that right, Gene? That is correct. Fort Huachuca. Near Sierra Vista, Arizona. Near, C near Sierra Vista. That's right. And down in the southern part of Arizona, you've got that and then just a bunch of like mining little cities and, and whatnot. So in Huachuca City, I'm driving there because Fort, like the Army, the U.S. Army installation down there was one of my customers when I first moved out here to Arizona. So I drove all the way down there to meet with my contacts. And as I'm driving back. I passed by the strip club and I swear I thought maybe I was just seeing things. I thought it was a, 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 an oasis, a mirage, but there is, there was a strip club called from dust till dawn. Now I had to research just to make sure for this podcast that I wasn't seeing things. This is an actual place. I'll post it on Twitter. Unfortunately it closed. It's no longer there, but just like anything on the internet, the reviews live on. It says, you ever wanted to see that toothless girl at the counter of your Walmart, local Walmart naked? The one with a muffin top and a lazy eye? Well, you may well have seen her dancing and getting all sorts of naked at from dusk till dawn. The drinks are obnoxiously expensive for what this place is. I'd give this facility zero stars if I could, but sometimes their food is pretty good. So this guy apparently has gone multiple times not to look at the dancers, but for the food. Yeah, this is like King B watching a series on Netflix or Hulu <laughs> where he's like, this is fucking terrible. I watched all three seasons and they were just goddamn awful. <laughs> but, I, I, but I liked yeah. it. I, I liked it for the actress. I liked it for the food. Uh, but, but Gene, you were just in Portland and fret not, yes. dear listeners, there is a From Dust Till Dawn strip club. This is, however, uh, unlike uh, the bloodthirsty vampires that exist in this movie, Casa Diablo 2, is actually a vegan strip club where your options can be read out loud by a topless bartender who, according to a sign by the bar, is also available for private dances. Now, Gene, you told me that Portland has the, the highest concentration of strip clubs in the United States. It does, and it's a very different strip club culture, Raj. So a couple things to note about Portland. First of all, if you're trying to go to Portland and find uh, Casa Diablo 2 – you you can't just go there and ask for the devil strip club because I will note, gentlemen, 
that there are, and I want to point this out to the reader. I am not reading this off of any notes. This is <laughs> purely out of my memory. There is Devil's Point. There's Lucky Devil. There's Dante's Sinferno. And there's Casa Diablo 2. All in Portland. All strip clubs. Well, Dante's is a music venue that sometimes has cabaret. But anyway, I want to tell you guys about a little something special at <laughs> Devil's Point that happens every Sunday night. And Devil's Point is out in the avenue. So if you're if you're familiar with Portland, this is out on 52nd Avenue. So it is it's kind of in the working class, like blue collar part of, of Portland, east of the river. And Devil's Point is a dive bar. It has one stage. At any given time, you have a max of five dancers. A tall boy of beer, like a Rainier or PBR, is three bucks. A mixed drink is about four bucks. And on Sunday night, they have stripper And that's when you go up and you sing on stage while a stripper is taking her clothes off fully nude. She goes fully nude right next to you. Why do people have to complicate this? Well, I don't need a fucking vegan strip club. You're you're not going in there to sing karaoke. Why the fuck do people do this? You're making it difficult. You're going to a strip club to see naked people. I don't want a buffet. I don't want someone to sing to me. Uh, well, so, so that's the difference, Big D, is Portland strip culture is very different. So in Arizona, I, I'm a huge fan of the Highlighter. I will be a Highlighter fan until the day I die. It is the greatest strip club ever. Roger, add that to my itinerary, please. Yeah, I've already it's already on there. It's already on there. We're gonna go there. But Portland is not about a bunch of guys sitting in the dark on like cushioned seats, watching women on stage, maybe going up occasionally, giving them a dollar or two, and really the dancers making their money on private dances and table dances. And there's nothing wrong with that, Arizona. We're very good at that. Mm -hmm. Portland, it's a party. Right. So there is a dancer on stage, but you have gay men you have lesbians you have party people who are just out to have drinks and have a fucking blast yeah. and there also are strippers on stage yeah they just like to happen to have strippers but unlike the uh, i guess copious amounts of boobs that are in portland strip clubs and at the highlighter here in uh in arizona i thought there would be more boobs in this movie yeah, I was on a flight out to Portland when I watched this, and I was like, oh, shit. I just remembered that there's a bunch of titties in this movie, and there's people sitting on either side of me. And I'm like, oh, boy. So, but I watched the AMC on demand version. So, <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> no, no titties at all. They're all bleeped <laughs> out. And, and what's great about the movie is that you actually, I don't think you see boobs until they've are like they've mm -hmm. vamped out. By the way, listeners, there's vampires in this movie. Um, but uh, what was shocking is not so much the boobs part is that they they bleeped out pussy on Four. AMC. Interesting. Cheech could not say pussy. They cut the whole pussy scene. And then when he does say pussy a couple times, when uh, Juliette Lewis walks up and uh, he mentions her pussy, it's bleeped out. And I was just thinking, man, like we live in such a <laughs> weird culture when you could watch people like impaling people on poles mm -hmm. and tearing off their limbs and blowing a hole in someone's head, it's okay. But saying the word pussy or showing a breast is off limits. So I got to ask guys, were the boobs good in this movie? Because I didn't see them. The, yeah. the, boobs, the, the boobs were good, but like I thought that I was going to see Salma Hayek boobs. I didn't. Like the, the And by the way, Mexican women are beautiful. I assume that was who they <laughs> casted. For the for the titty twister, I'm not sure if all of them were Mexican. I think there was one Asian stripper that was dancing. There's, I just thought there were more. I remember them being more. Maybe it was because I was a horny 14 year old when I watched this movie. There's not many, and the scenes are fast, so you barely see them, but they're all very beautiful. But again, I was hoping for some Salma Hayek boobage, like you get in uh, Desperado. There's none of that. We also didn't get to see Gloria, the bank teller, naked. Which is kind of a bummer. <laughs> oh, maybe that's in the, the uh, director's cut. But my mother's Swedish, and I've probably talked about this before. In Sweden, sex is opened. On regular TV, you can see a couple having sex. Breasts are nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, people get topless at the beach, and nobody even looks twice. They think Americans are bizarre that we would let kids or even like 10, 12-year-olds watch Terminator or watch a movie where they're ripping somebody's spine out. To them, it's bizarre what we're doing. And I agree with you, Gene. Our hang-up with sex as a, as a 
country is a joke. Come on, get over it. Why are yeah. we okay watching uh, or playing video games where you're killing people? That's more, that's stranger than this. The naked body and sex, it's natural. Let it go. But to answer your thing, Raj, I also remembered her being topless and she looks gorgeous in this movie. Gorgeous. She's a beautiful woman. But her with the top on, staying fully clothed, she's got the snake, the way she's dancing, suggestive. It is sexier with her being clothed than it could have been. If she was topless, it would have been cheap. Her dancing and pouring the drink down her leg into Richie's mouth, caliente. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, again, this is a tale of two movies. It takes an hour before they get to the titty twister. And I, that's where I really feel like this movie shines is the actors that you wouldn't expect to be in the type of movie when you get to the hour mark and it turns into this vampire kill fest because it has some really amazing actors who really give pretty good performances. And we're not talking about uh, Big D's, you know, little Lou. lack of love for Asian actors. Yeah, they're, they're well, you know, Tarantino, he has his favorites. It's the guys who appear in all his movies. And sometimes they blur in my mind. But you have Harvey Keitel. He was in Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction. His voice also was uncredited in the narration in Glorious Bastards. You have Cheech Marin, who plays three roles. Love it. You know, he's the guard. He's a strip club doorman. He's the gangster Carlos. Uh, and then he's also appeared in seven movies directed by Robert Rodriguez. Then you have Danny Trejo, who's been in nine, uh, Dust Till Dawn, Desperado, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, Planet Terror, Machete, Machete Kills, and the Spy Kids movies. Robert Rodriguez directed the Spy Kids movies. Yeah, I mean, Robert, that's, that's kind of a trademark of Tarantino and, and Rodriguez is that they use the same actors again and again and again. But I think the best of this movie is when Keitel and Clooney are in the RV together and Clooney is trying to control him. And that's when you really see the brilliance of like, they're both really acting and really coming across. And I think that's what makes this movie. One of my favorites is you don't expect in a movie that's campy and over the top. And people just remember it for vampires and Salma Hayek dancing with a snake. You forget that these type of scenes exist. And I think that's, that's the brilliance of, of this movie. I agree. And I think it would have been much better if Tarantino had started to use Ernest Liu in his other movies, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, and Glorious Bastards. He could have turned that kid around. Yeah. Well, the bar employees at the Titty Twister reveal themselves as vampires and start killing most of the patrons. Richie is killed by a stripper and dies. Only Seth, Jacob, Kate, Scott, a biker named Sex Machine, and Frost, a Vietnam veteran, survive. The others are reborn as vampires. When an army of vampires assemble outside, the survivors lock themselves in a back room, but Sex Machine is bitten, becomes a vampire, and bites Frost and Jacob. Frost throws Sex Machine through the door, allowing the vampires to enter while Frost turns into a vampire. So it was really sad to see all the sexy ladies turn into vampires. That was a real downer <laughs> because you could at least make them sexy vampires. <laughs> That would have been cool. But Salma Hayek, the way she got involved in this movie is really interesting. Uh, so she was cast as a stripper in 1995's Four Rooms, which you mentioned before, Raj. Mm -hmm. And not not exactly even cast. So if, if you haven't seen Four Rooms, it, it's fantastic. They took four directors. It's like an anthology. So Alison Anders, Alexander Rockwell, Robert Rodriguez, and Quentin Tarantino uh, each got a room to direct. And basically, Tim Roth is the star. He's like Ted the Bellhop, and he bounces from room to room. It's it's hilarious. Yeah, it's anyway, they needed a stripper for the room that Robert Rodriguez was directing, a stripper to be on TV. And he's like, Salma Hayek, can you be the stripper here? You don't need to get naked. And also, like your face won't even be in it. You're just a stripper on TV. So he calls her up, just says, hey, put on a bathing suit and come on down. They shoot it. And based on that, Tarantino sees that and he's like, I got to write her into Dust Till Dawn as a stripper. So he writes her in as Santanico Pandemonium. <laughs> and that's how she got the role. But what's great is if you watch the movie, you'll notice that she only dances for Richie. And she like puts her foot in his mouth and she like snowballs a, a bunch of booze into his mouth, too. <laughs> and when they interviewed her for that, they're like, why did you only dance for him? And what was that all about? She's like, he just wrote it that way. 
So Tarantino specifically put in the directions, she's going to strip for me and then pour beer down her leg into my mouth off her toe. Well, hold on. Isn't a snowball where you yeah. pass the ejaculant from mouth to mouth? Mm-hmm. Yes, but in this case, it's beer instead yeah, it of does, It doesn't have to be ejaculate, <laughs> but I mean, if you've watched Clerks, yeah. Hey, Roger, let's go snowball some beer. I don't think we would call it that. Listen, there's no way we're going to not make that weird. It's not like there's a normal way to do that. Hey, Raj, come spit some beer into my mouth. It'll be super heterosexual. Baby bird, baby bird, that beer. Yeah, baby bird. <laughs> baby bird. Well, you're talking about that particular scene, Salma Hayek, again, like you said, goes straight for Tarantino's <laughs> mouth, inserts the foot, pours a shot of tequila into his mouth, like where it runs down her body. That's oh, cool. Sexy. Then she does the baby bird uh, of beer or liquor or tequila oh. or whatever into his mouth. Now, there are few women that I would allow in this world to have them do that to me. Salma Hayek is one of those uh, people. But have you ever allowed someone to do that to you? Would you do that? And and what would it take for someone? What's the weirdest body part you've ever done a shot off? I mean, Raj, you know, I am a hasher. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a member of the Hash House Harriers, I have butt chugged. Oh, so it no, get. you haven't. You know you haven't. Oh, yeah. Before or after the run? Oh, it was, no, it was, before, it was the day before the run. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, come on, man. I'm not a heathen. <laughs> yeah. Big D, would you ever, would you ever butt chug someone? I, I don't even know what it is. I don't even want to ask. The, the, the worst thing I ever did was I, at spring break, it was a beer chugging contest. Halfway through, I puked back into the pitcher and then just kept going. I mean, no, no, no. Yeah. It earned me a reputation. The rest of the week, people would be like, yo, you're the puke guy. <laughs> you're like, hey, what's up? <laughs> what what's up, up, Snowball? <laughs> you know, that's, that's not something you're supposed to be proud of. Uh, in, in college, you're proud of things that you normally shouldn't be, but it worked yeah. out. I got free drinks. Like going to Arizona State. <laughs> So, Raj, earlier in the movie, you talked about how it seems to have like a clear definition uh, between the first half and second half. And you were talking about the genre. I think there's also a notable difference in the tone and almost quality of the movie. The first half, it's gritty. It's raw. It's Tarantino. It is like a lot of his other movies. And then once the vampire twist kicks in. It turns into this, it's almost comical. It's a joke. The vampires are jumping back and forth on the pool table. They're flying through the air with, with noises. They're like, flying. Uh, there's, there's flames when they get hit. They explode. They turn into goo. You have our buddy uh, Lou throwing around holy water-filled condom water balloons that are making people burst into flames. Can you imagine, okay, if at the end of, let's say, Pulp Fiction, when we get to the gimp dungeon ball gag rape scene, if it turned into something comedic like this and Marcellus Wiley broke out and they started jumping and flying around the room, you'd be like, what the fuck is this? If they had continued that gritty tone and you had the second half, the vampires be something more serious like Blade, I think this movie would have been fucking legendary. I just love that you just use Blade as an example of a very serious uh, vampire movie. But changing gears can be done really well. So you think about like a Full Metal Jacket, right? It went from funny to not funny real fucking fast. But it works. It makes sense. That's the part here is it changes gears, but it doesn't feel like there's a reason for it. Um, Actually, it's Marcellus Wallace. Marcellus Wiley is a retired oh, American he's football on ESPN. defensive end. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Big D, you mentioned that these vampires are like jumping all around in a goofy way. I, I can only assume because they're on this Aztec temple and this place has been there forever in ancient Mexico that these vampires have lasted there for a really long time. And I just want to know how, because these vampires suck at everything. No pun intended. Like mm-hmm. their go to move is they spring up on you and they just go ah, <laughs> until you do something about it. One at a time. One at a time. Except for the poor Asian kid. They all pile on the Asian kid. Like Big D piled on him in his <laughs> acting. Yeah. I mean, look, the numbers are against our heroes. There's there's like fucking hundreds of vampires and a handful of mortals. But thankfully, these vampires are all offense. They're, they're squishy. They're easy to kill. 
and they have to fight a super strong Vietnam vet, <laughs> two hotshot bank robbers, a preacher, and a bullwhip expert with a Derringer dick. Like these are our heroes. I, I remember thinking all these guys were super cool when I was a kid. I'm just like, oh come, this is it. This is the fight. It was weak. Yeah, they're they're incompetent. You figure that they would have had this down pat by now. They've been doing it for generations. But it seems like these few heroes can take them out. And Gene, I have some other questions here. We understand the tactics are terrible, but the world of the vampire, it's it's still relatively new to, to Roger and I. So we, I have some questions here that I need you to basically <laughs> answer okay. about vampires and shed some light. Okay. So question one here. We know vampires, they really like blood. Does that mean they're susceptible to things like AIDS or hep C or other bloodborne diseases? That is a no. So vampires uh, are dead. They are the undead. So therefore, they they don't have immune systems like the living do. uh, And they are not susceptible to any sort of diseases. However, in some vampire lore or in some vampire tales, vampirism itself is a disease. Right. Yeah. And therefore, that is the disease they can catch. They call it the blood disease. And therefore, they can have that. But like hep C, AIDS, none of that stuff would affect a vampire. Yeah, and they have, and, and that same vampirism uh, also causes a, a major allergy to UV light or UV rays, right? And that's why they can't go outside. And purifying agents such as silver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so number two here. If I were to put a cross in a vampire's mouth, close the mouth, would the vampire explode in front of me? Depending on the lore that you subscribe to, this could be a thing. So the cross typically is used to ward off a vampire uh the the sight of it and it's not the cross itself what it is is actually uh the combined faith of people uh imbued into an object so uh because christianity is believed in by so many people in the symbol of the cross that belief that faith is the opposite of a vampire's curse, and therefore it will ward them off. <laughs> if you could force a vampire to ingest a cross, it would likely be lethal to that vampire. Okay, but you say it's any object that people believe in. So is the yes. same for like other major religions, like Judaism or correct uh, I- I- Islam? Yeah, yeah. You could chuck a dreidel into a vampire's <laughs> mouth. He's fucked. It's also harder to pass. Could you imagine? Yeah. Okay, so so next question. Would a chandelier falling on a vampire cause him to burst into flames? Okay, that's that's an interesting one because uh, it shouldn't, except for, I guess, if that chandelier had wood and it pierced the heart of the vampire or decapitated the vampire. Um, the bursting into flames thing is really interesting because vampires don't typically burst into flames. This is, this is very much a dust till dawn thing. Uh, that one was a little weird to me. Okay, could a priest bless a super soaker and everything in there becomes holy water and and you just spray instant death to all the vampires? Yeah, the holy water on the outside of a vampire is highly unlikely to be lethal. Uh, If you were to submerge a vampire entirely in holy water, that would probably take effect. And same as the cross, if you had the vampire ingest holy water, like willingly drink it uh, or forcefully drink it, I guess, if you made a little vampire foie gras, then that would probably... Uh, kill them but yeah just throwing a condom full of holy water on a vampire should not kill that vampire yeah uh, but you also saw this like in kevin smith dogma right where the the priest you know blessed his his driver right and so they use that to kill the demons and then they bless the holy water and they stuck the demon's head in the holy water and the heads exploded so we also we also saw it in lost boys that's right yeah so I, I now that with what I've learned from you, I think I might be able to answer my last question. My last question was to be, what makes a vampire so mushy? Because Frost actually does the Kalima and rips one of the vampire's hearts out, <laughs> stabs no it sense. with a pencil. Is it because they're undead that they're so mushy? So here's the thing. What makes vampire stories so great is that everybody's got their own take on it right like vampires are different depending on what cultural origin they're from who wrote the story Uh, so in this story they take actually great care to talk about it on screen Uh, sex machine talks about how these vampires are mushy because they shouldn't be they should normally have the same body consistency as a as a human Uh, but what makes less sense is the fact that the heart is beating a vampire shouldn't have a beating heart they don't they don't have an active circulatory system Exactly. 
Well, Seth, Kate, and Scott escaped to a storeroom, followed shortly by an injured but still alive Jacob brandishing a shotgun. In the storeroom, they fashioned weapons from truck cargo the vampires have looted from past victims, including a stake mounted on a pneumatic drill, a crossbow, and, again, holy water in a super soaker, which, again, Jacob uses his faith to bless. Jacob, knowing he will soon turn into a vampire because he was bitten, makes Scott and Kate promise to kill him when he changes so probably what surprises me most about this movie and differs from my memory the most is the the special effects the vampires i remembered them being frightening uh, looking somewhat realistic yeah they look terrible they're one of the worst parts of this movie there's no consistency some look like orcs from you know lord of the rings mm -hmm. some look like vampires they some turn to mush some explode there is no consistency when frost turns into a vampire it's laughable he's like a bulldog it looks like <laughs> yeah. they just gave him like a big jaw it's split in the middle but the only good one was vampire tarantino did you notice how much Tarantino in this as a vampire Richie? It looks like Tarantino today. He's got that giant forehead, this bloated, blotchy face, the hairline back. It looked like it was predicting the future. Yeah, I didn't even realize he turned into a vampire. <laughs> yeah, like, that's right. Yeah, why is he staying? Oh, no, oh, okay. Yeah, he does look slightly different. No, yeah, he's not, he's not looking uh, great these days. <laughs> no. I love you too, Seth. Tarantino looked really good in this film, guys. He was a really oh, handsome what? guy. Oh. I thought, no, I'm not saying that when he turns uh. into a vampire, I'm talking about like when he's just crazy psychotic. Seth. He's, he's thin. He's young. His face uh. is, uh, oh, you're just passing Alec Baldwin and, and Quentin Tarantino's dick. Back I and like forth. Tarantino. Mm. What can I say? He looks like when McDonald's had the Mac tonight commercials, mm -hmm. he yes. looks like the yes. moon. Yeah. Yes. Right. If you took some pubes uh -huh. and stuck them on his chin, I'm fine with that. <laughs> so here's the thing, though, is that this movie, it would be OK. B Big D's, you mentioned like shitty makeup, you know, campy uh, action sequences. All that stuff would be fine. Everything I like about From Dust Till Dawn, I liked better about The Evil Dead. The cheesy lines, the inventive weapons, the memorable action scenes. But you had a bigger budget. You had this star cast. It's a major Hollywood film. The Evil Dead cost $350,000 to make in 1981. This is the kind of movie I would expect for $350,000. From Dust Till Dawn had $19 million in 1996. This does not look like a $19 million movie to me. Well, if you've seen any later seasons of The Walking Dead, I mean, this is this is Nicotero's you know, DNA all over it. Yeah, but The Walking Dead looks better than this. And the only scene that had me engaged in this vampire attack is... Once they complete the first wave and they kill all the initial vampires, they circle up and they start to do like I was doing with Eugene and talk about what do we know about vampires? And they're going back. Typical Tarantino. The dialogue's great. What do we know? Is it silver, crosses, holy water, wooden stakes? Uh, and then the funny dialogue, like, do you have any crosses? Yeah, in the RV? Okay, we don't have any crosses. Uh, what about silver? Does anybody have silver? No, we don't have silver. That shit's funny. But then when the vampire is attacking that second wave, it's just back to Benny Hill and fucking pool table jump shots and flying across the room and stacking dead fucking vampires on the legs of the table. It was a fucking joke. But like what weapon would you utilize if you were back in that room? And I still don't understand why they didn't just stay back in that room. Uh, what weapon would you have utilized? Would you have done the pneumatic drill with the wooden stake? Would you have done the super soakers? with the holy water grenades would you have done the crossbow or would you have done the shotgun cross thing that harvey Keitel uses no rog you hit the nail on the head my favorite weapon in that room would have been the fucking door <laughs> yes i would keep it yeah. shut <laughs> until daylight and fucking hang out there <laughs> yeah. i'm like and and their logic there if you watch what seth and uh jacob are talking about is look we're fucked we're going to die. Let's take as many of these guys with us as we can. That's the idea, right? That they're just like, hey, listen, we're going to lose this fight. But, let's go. but I'm like, why? Why? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, Carlos is coming. Just chill in there. It's your best bet. Yeah. They can't get through that door. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and again, th this is the thing. It, like, that would be the one thing that would be the first thing that I would think of when we're going through what a vampire's 
what do we know of vampires? The big one, UV light, <laughs> you know, like let's, let's open up all the windows or let's stay in the room and then just hope that the UV light takes care of it. How about you got fucking giant wood cases? How about we barricade the door? Instead, <laughs> right. George Clooney, Seth is whittling a chair leg to make a pneumatic spike. Fucking barricade the door, George. Interesting factoids about vampires, if you don't know these already. Also, a vampire, you could take a chance on the fact that vampires can't come in unless you invite them. Now, I know that's typically <laughs> your home, oh, no. that's right. but I would at least be like, hey, I'm pretty sure that yeah. they can't come in. But also, guys, this is a great trick uh, if you if you are being chased by a vampire. Vampires, they suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. And so... It is said in many cultures that if you feel a vampire might come through a door, leave a bowl of rice outside your door yeah. because a vampire will be compelled to count how many grains of rice are in that bowl. They also say you can carry salt in your pocket and throw it behind you if you're being chased by a vampire and he or she will have to stop and count how many grains of salt you threw. The problem with leaving rice out in front of your door is it might attract young Asian kids, young adopted <laughs> Asian kids that the vampires would then feed on. I'm glad you brought that up, Rod, because <laughs> I do want to talk about one thing I did not like about this character, Seth Gecko, is that he is a hypocritical, racist, homophobic piece of shit. Yeah. He calls Mr. Lou a Jap, uh, and the character is Chinese. Uh, he also uses uh, the word fag. Uh, he is hypocritical in the sense that he tells everybody to be cool, but he's the one losing his mind in the bar. And he even says, you know, do as I say, don't do as I do. It was very hard to like Seth. And I think we were supposed to, I think the movie made us, we were supposed to like Seth as some sort of a protagonist. I, I do want to point out though, that in all of his deplorable acts, this scene where he's, you know, showing a little bit of bravery, bonding with everybody else in there, it was the most enjoyable of the movie for me. Raj, you like the scene between Keitel and Clooney in the RV. I like the scene between Keitel and Clooney in this storeroom. It had the least flair, the least special effects, the least inventiveness of the entire second half of the film, but it was the most enjoyable. It was just like watching that classic A-team montage, and, and I really enjoyed watching this part. Yeah. And this moment of social justice has been brought to you by Gene Lyons. Zoom, 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 boom, 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 Here he comes to save the day. Seth should have died. The group make their final assault on the undead. Sex machine mutates into a large rat-like creature that attacks Seth, but he is killed. Jacob becomes a vampire, but Scott hesitates to kill him, allowing Jacob to bite him. Scott then hits Jacob with holy water and shoots him. Scott is then overwhelmed by vampires who begin to devour him. He begs for death and Kate shoots him. Okay, more problems here. There's over 122 on-screen deaths, mostly vampires in this scene. Where the fuck is the pile of bones? Where's the skeletons? Where's the big pile of bush? This was like an 80s video game where you would kill the bad guy. He'd blink and then disappear and respawn. I understand it's a tight yeah, set. I think they explained that. Oh, cut. They didn't explain. They anything. explain it with the, they all burn up and they disappear. They incinerate themselves. The whole floor should be a giant pile of mush and bones. I agree. There were some scenes where there was a bunch of mush and bones on the floor though. I mean, yeah. not, look, I got a better solution. Okay. Rod, you mentioned that Kurtzman and Nicotero, uh, who went on to work on the walking dead, uh, were involved with this movie. I, I get that the mid nineties were vampire obsessed, which was great for the goth scene. Thank you, Dustal Don. But everything about this movie suggests it should have just been zombies. It, they're fucking, they're supposed to be zombies. Like, mm -hmm. it makes much more sense. Vampires are associated with stealth and guile. They bewitch you and they kill you stealthingly, sometimes even willingly. And a bite doesn't just immediately turn you into a vampire. Usually they have <laughs> to sire you. There's a whole process. You got to go through a death and then you're reborn. <laughs> All this shit. They could have just saved a lot of money and made more sense by just using zombies as the threat. It doesn't take away from the movie at all. A, a zombie bartender, zombie strippers. <laughs> what would you like? Yeah, but then there wouldn't there wouldn't <laughs> zombies don't have like the element of surprise, right? Like if you're a zombie, you're a zombie. At least vampires can pretend to be human. And then like there's that, you know, they're they're all bringing it's like the, it's like in Blade. The most interesting scene in Blade is the cold open right when all these 
goth kids are going down to this underground rave and you're thinking to myself, oh, this is, you know, and this is all before the Matrix. So it was all like, you know, hard house, goth, industrial dance music. And then and then all of a sudden the sprinklers turn on blood and then you realize that this is a feeding like they, they they're bringing humans into feed. That's an interesting part. And that's kind of the same thing that they're doing here in dust till dawn like they're they're attracting truckers they're bringing them in with the promise of mexican boobies and and uh and smelly pussy and then and then they're they're feeding on them i just want to point out that if we ever cover blade you guys are both obligated to give it at most two wipes because you guys are sucking blades dick right now (laughs) oh it's fucking i love it i love it and you talk about the blood coming out of the sprinkler system there's a little less blood in this movie but not much And I kept being like, I don't remember vampires having green blood. So I looked it up. They went with green blood because the red blood and just shooting all over the lens, that would have gotten them an NC-17 rating. So it's the same reason in Kill Bill. I never even knew they did the sword fighting Mm -hmm. in black and white because for some reason in the U.S. and the way they rate these movies, if you have black and white blood or green blood, it's much less traumatic for the kids. It's crazy. But yeah, that's you're exactly right. It goes into black and white. No, but there's a lot of blood in uh, Django Unchained, right? When he goes through the shootout. V- very different movie. Well, as vampires surround Kate and Seth, streams of morning light enter through the bullet holes in the building, making the vampires back away. Carlos arrives and his bodyguards blast the door open, letting sunlight in, killing the vampires. Kate asks Seth if she can go with him to El Rey, but he refuses, apparently as a kindness leaving her with some cash. Kate then drives away in the RV, leaving the titty twister behind. But it is then revealed as the camera pans back to be the top of a partially buried Aztec temple in movie. I absolutely love that terrible matte painting. You can see this. What did you say the budget was, Gene? $19 million. I swear, Emma and I, we painted this background. This, this, this matte... <laughs> It doesn't look anything lifelike. The temple's way too big. The pile of trucks, you know, from the 20s and the 30s. Oh, we get it. I do appreciate that they attempted to fill in the holes in the vampire story. I do. Uh, and, and, you know, it just it looks bad. And I was surprised. This is 1996. You couldn't have done a little better. At least it's, it's epic. They tried to answer it. And it gave me a good chuckle. I love that things that Tarantino works on, there's always some sort of a mystery. Like you think about Pulp Fiction with the briefcase. What's in it? Is it Marcellus Wallace's soul? Is it something very valuable? You don't know, right? It's a MacGuffin. It's just a, it's a thing, right? Um, El Rey is really interesting because you see at the end of the movie, uh, Seth does not let Kate go with him. And you're thinking, well, she just lost her whole family. She's an orphan now. And if it's this paradise, why wouldn't he take her with him to just, you know, have a safe place to go. And there's a very good reason for that. The The story is loosely based on this uh, book that was written called The Getaway. And in The Getaway, there are these fugitives and they're going to find El Rey. And El Rey is a person. He's the king who rules over this uh, safe haven for criminals, right? And so it's a sanctuary and criminals can live there openly without fear of being extradited back to the US. But Everything that is for sale there is a luxury or first class. So the cost of living is incredibly high. And El Rey, the ruler of this uh, sanctuary, dictates that all the residents have to spend a certain amount of money per month. So you can't choose to live cheap. So no matter how wealthy you are when you arrive, you quickly give all your money to El Rey. And then if you run out of money and can't buy things, there is a village outside of his property that has no food, uh, nothing to drink, and there's just people committing suicide and cannibals, and criminals are just killing each other in a way to accumulate money to pay El Rey. So you're in the sanctuary, but you know that you could kill somebody and steal their money to keep paying El Rey. And that's what the whole story is based on. So that's where Seth is going. I think you just described Seattle, Washington. (laughs) Basically. But, But he doesn't want Kate... He doesn't want Kate to go there because he's going to be safe from the law there, but he knows what his fate eventually will be. He's going to have to he's going to have to return to this life of crime in order to support this lifestyle. Right. Uh, fuck Seth. How do we think Kate's going to handle this? She's lost her family. Her mother just <laughs> She's died. fine. 
she seems good. pretty okay with it and she's going to drive back yeah. to the u.s alone i, I think yeah. kate's got some dark days ahead <laughs> yeah juliette lewis again not the best in, in in my opinion george clooney carried this movie yeah, he had a bumpy start in the first few scenes, but he got better as the movie went on. You got to remember, again, this was, as you mentioned, his first you know, major Hollywood role where he was actually starring in the movie. And I, I, I finally did start to understand Seth Gecko as a character, and I knew that he, I had finally come to grips with his character and begun to appreciate it. When he drops that line, which is one of my favorite lines, is after it's all over and Carlos asks him, he goes, what were they, like, uh, psychos? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and Seth goes, did those look like psychos to you? Psychos do not explode on contact with sunlight, no matter how crazy they are. And I was fucking, you know, again, I've seen this movie a million times and I, I did laugh to myself. I thought it's just fucking perfectly delivered. Clooney has a charm uh, that is undeniable. And I'm glad that he's found more of a place with the Coen brothers where I feel like they can really use his talents in the best way as possible. Uh, but you know what? He did all right in this movie. Out of all the performances, I would say his and Keitel were the best. Yeah, I again, I was excited to see him play Batman. No, um, talking about being excited, uh, this movie made me want to go to Mexico. So, <laughs> so I, I, Big D, Big D, text you texted me. <laughs> yeah, you're coming out. You're, you're, yeah, you're coming out like in two weeks for your birthday. We're gonna go to the grand opening. Gene, you have, you've had this on your calendar for months. It's the grand opening. Yeah, the Grand Opening Medieval Times. We we've been talking about this for a very long time. <laughs> Way too I still long. haven't seen Cable Guy, so uh, so I'll probably have to watch it before we go to Medieval Times. But uh, but yeah, yeah, Big D's coming out. I'm super geeked for this, uh, and I'm not going to get in a fight with you. So it's going to be really great. Nice. <laughs> so we're so, so there's all kinds of um, different uh, itinerary items that I that I that he's like, hey, what can we do? One of them, he's like, after you're watching this movie, he's like, can we go to Mexico? How far away is Mexico from you? It's like what three and a half hours. That's not the issue. I mean, we can go to but the border town. If you're on your way to Puerto Panesco, there's there's really nothing there. Yeah. So for those who don't know, this is going to be the first time that the three of us are like in the same room at the same time. And we're going to be doing some fun things. We decided because Gene Cable Guy is coming up here in a few weeks. So we decided oh, wow. to christen the brand new Castle Scottsdale and the brand new Medieval Times. Uh, so we're going to be going to Medieval Times probably like August 17th in Scottsdale. So if anybody wants to join us, shoot us a line. Yeah. You know, come down. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll cheer there for the Black Knight. Uh, and it should be fun. But uh, yeah, it's going to be I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be the first time that we actually get to hang out. So if I get this right, we're going to go to Medieval Times. We're going to go to Mexico. We should probably stop, stop in Fort Huachuca. And we're going to the Highlighter. This is this is going to be the weekend. And kayaking with the King Bee. A midnight oh, God. Kayak. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, okay. So we got to go to Mexico first because then we buy drugs down there. Right. And then, and we, then, and then that, that propels us through the rest of the weekend. Right. Exactly. I yeah, like it. Exactly. Uh, Big D, have you been to a phone party before? Uh, in, in Cancun? <laughs> I don't know. Is, is this something we want to do? Oh, you've been to fancy Mexico. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I also need to buy serapes for my new home decor. So this is coming together nicely. You can get a, uh, you can probably get a bison skull down in Mexico as well. Got one. Oh, nice. Now's the time of the podcast where we break out our shot meter and give you our wipe review. A zero wipe movie is an absolutely perfect movie. Uh, it's like when Salma Hayek, uh, is uh, scantily clothed, dancing with a python. She walks up to you. She sticks her foot in your mouth and then pours some sort of alcoholic liquid and then baby birds it, uh, the remaining into your mouth. It's it's just absolutely perfect. But there's no dripping. It doesn't go onto your chin. It's just absolutely clean. She gets everything right in there. And you have Salma Hayek foot. Um, the uh, five white movie, though, is when you're when you're battling mushy vampires <laughs> Uh, and it's just they're exploding all over the place. It's just a mess. Uh, you can't clean it up with toilet paper. You have to burn it with fire uh, to get the smell out. So uh, zero wipes good, five wipes bad. We'll start with you, Gene. How many wipes do you give from dusk till dawn? First of all, Raj, I want to applaud you for inventing a new term, <laughs> Salma Hayek foot. <laughs> Salma Hayek foot. It's like the greatest disease you could possibly contract. Mm. Uh, it's very hard for me to dislike a Tarantino movie. And it's even harder for me to dislike a vampire movie on our scale. 2.5 wipes is an average movie. 
and from dust till dawn has enough going for it to be above average it has clever writing uh standout performances homages to so many great horror movies and so many great horror traditions it has that mexican charm that robert rodriguez brings to movies and it has loads of gore but it is definitely hindered by being dated this movie feels like it came out in 1996 and maybe was a 1996 movie that that was stuck in the 1992 paradigm uh in a different director's hands this could have been gold i think tarantino did a great job on the script not so much the acting but as far as uh as far as ways to make this better i would love to see it with a with a better director more competent director for this style of movie and i would have to go with a two wipe score for from dust till dawn see i'm gonna have to disagree with you i think robert rodriguez is the perfect director for this movie and as we talked about it's a tale of two different movies and for as much as it takes itself seriously in the first half it's equally as absurd and silly in the second half, unabashedly so, without pretense. I think it does still hold up for what it is, which is a B flick that if you went in not knowing that there were vampires, your, your head would explode from how crazy it is, just like Christians did. I think it was cool to see all the younger version of the actors that we know today, like Clooney and Keitel and Juliette Lewis and Tarantino act in a movie like this because you will never see this again this is something that will never happen again you're never going to get these caliber of actors in a movie like this and i think it's something that should be treasured i still think this is one of the coolest vampire movies of our generation and for that it's a one and a half wipe movie for me that leaves one last remaining wipe score it goes to you big d what do you give it Uh, i'm gonna give it a three wipe I think the first half of the movie is a one and a half. It's strong. I enjoyed it. I would watch it again. The second half is garbage. So I'm going to say it's half a movie. So I'm going to double it up. That's why three wipes. But the problem I have is with the tone of the movie. It's like you directed it in a in a vacuum where each half, where Tarantino did the first half, Rodriguez did the second half. They didn't tell each other what they were going to do. And then they put it together. I want to remind you that the beginning of the movie is so gritty It has the execution of a Texas Ranger in a realistic fashion. It then has the rape and murder of a bank teller. Then the second half has slapstick flying vampires jumping across pool tables and getting stabbed in their heart with a, with a pencil. If you had kept that tone all the way through, this shit would be fucking awesome. I will watch it again as I did today up until the point where some Hayek turns into a vampire and then I'll just turn it off. Uh, It is, worse than an average film probably better for a vampire flick but again it's just sad because it was a waste of potential you had the budget you had the cast you had the directors why this wasn't a more even film i don't know and it's one of the movies that disappointed me but uh, i think a three is fair for what we get uh, in its totality as a movie well if we were to add up three wipes one and a half and two wipes Then divide by three. That gives us our combined Shat score, which is what, Gene? Raj, it sits just above average. From Dust Till Dawn has a Shat score average of 2.16 repeating. And if we were to take that 2.16 repeated and and put it into that Aztec temple uh, where we house all of our Shat scores, where does that put it on the ranks of our movies? So this is now movie 117, and it's tied in the 53 spot with Home Alone, Major League, The Goonies, Under Siege. It is slightly better than True Romance and Rocky IV, yeah. and it is worse than Pet Cemetery and The Crimson Tide. I mean, that feels right, guys. <laughs> How the fuck did Under Siege get there? <laughs> Where? In that... Was that me? Come on, dude. Under Siege was funny. I gave it a two. You gave it a two. Roger gave it a two Under and a half. Siege is, that shit Under was Siege funny. is surprisingly funny. good and fun. Yes. Yeah. We liked it. Yeah, it's not bad. It was Seagal's best movie. Oh, by far. By far. I'm more shocked that the Goonies is there. And that's just because of Roger's three. Yeah. I mean, guys, this, yeah, this feels good. right. It's better than average. What else could you ask for this movie? <laughs> I agree. It's better than average. Yeah. I think it's great. I think it's great. 
Well, now it's the time of the podcast. I have to give you your shout outs. Gene, what's a shout out? Roger, shout out is our way of saying thank you for listening to the pod and visiting the website, shoutthemovies.com. Uh, if you go to shoutthemovies.com, put your name into the shout out slider. Uh, we will read it on the podcast for you. And this week's shout outs go out to Whiskey Jack, Big D's illegitimate son, <laughs> Martin the Mess, Andy Brown, Michael Johnson in East Maitland, Australia, Baby Shakers, Justin fucking Flynn, Tom C. from Newport News, Andrew from sunny Durham City, Simon, Katie Diss, Andy, I will keep entering until I hear Gene say E. Norma Stitz, <laughs> Brett from Melbourne, Australia, Titty Lindsay married Mr. Noodles, Gail in Northern Ireland, a.k.a. Westeros, Coley from Ireland, Susie from Norway, Yo, son, Raphael, Raf be crazy, Anthony Inkelbarger, D. Mitch from Seattle, also a fellow Disney College Program alum, Justin D., Uncle Dildo, Matt the Sand Trooper, Gordon T., and Sweet Erica Purebred. Thank you, everyone, who visited ShoutTheMovies.com and put your names in for shoutouts. Again, if you'd like to hear your name on the podcast, please go to ShoutTheMovies.com, fill out the shoutout form, and we'll read it on the air for you. And Big D, we have another commission in store for us next week. Is that correct? Uh, we do. But first, I want to thank Christian DeLeo again for commissioning this. Uh, it, it makes a difference. Every dollar helps us keep going. Uh, and the commissions keep going. Next week, we have one commissioned by Adam. And it is about Miami-Dade detectives Mike Lowell, played by Will Smith, and Marcus Burnett, played by Martin Lawrence, blow a fuse when $100 million worth of heroin they recently confiscated is heisted from the station headquarters. Suspecting it's an inside job, internal affairs gives them five days to track down the drugs before they shut down the narcotics division. Action meets farce when Marcus is compelled to masquerade as his partner in order to gain the trust of a call girl, Tia Leone, a key witness to their investigation. And again, it was commissioned by Adam R. It was released in 1995. And it's Roger's favorite director, Michael Bay. It made $141 million at the box office. And Jerry Bruckheimer, another Roger Roper favorite, was the yeah. producer with Don Simpson. Yeah, I, j I just want to correct that. It's Mike Lowry who play, uh, is played by Will Smith, and it's Taya Leone who plays the sex worker, which is now the more accepted term, not the call girl. But again, this was 1995, and it was Michael Bay, and I hate this podcast because it's, it's, it's turning into the Michael Bay podcast. It used, to be, it used to be the John Hughes podcast. It's now the Michael Bay. I don't know what the fuck we were thinking in the 90s. Sorry he made some of the biggest yeah. movies of Ugh. all time. Ugh. You weren't complaining when it was the James Cameron podcast. I was not. Well, that concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're everywhere, including Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram. Just follow the handle at Shat the Movies. We're also on Facebook. You just enter it in, and you'll be taken there. Our website is ShatTheMovies.com. You can email us, though, directly, hosts at ShatTheMovies.com. You can donate and support the podcast. All of our links are on the website. And there's also a survey link if you want us to continue to do this. We just need a quick, simple two-minute survey from you. No personal information is gathered. We just want to know a little bit more about your demographics so we can get some vape sponsors, some mattress sponsors, stamps.com sponsors, hymns. Dollar hymns shave. sponsors, dollar shave. Um, so it, it's on the it's on the shatthemovies.com forward slash survey is where you can do that. Just go in and get that. We're everywhere. Fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please be sure to leave a five-star review. That does really help the podcast grow. You can also check out our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and True Detective. You can find all the information on that website, chatontv.com. On behalf of my co-host, Big D, Dick Eber and Gene Sex Machine Lions. I'm Roger Roper. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. If you didn't already know what it is, stay tuned for the trailer. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Good night and good luck. It was the perfect crime. No one saw it coming. No one heard a thing. This was our career bust. This is what, $100 million? This had to have been an inside job. Everything went according to plan. But there was one thing 
they didn't plan on. Let's do this right. No gunshots, no dead bodies. Well, you know, if I recall correctly, the last couple dead bad guys belong to you. Please. You ain't even trying to compare body counts. Uh, 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 should I keep going all day? I'm, uh, I'm out. I'm out. Detectives Mike Lowry and Marcus Burnett. Don't be alarmed, we're Negroes. Oh, man. Oh, that's too much bass in your voice. That scared white folks. You gotta sound like them. We were wondering if we can borrow a couple of brown sugar. On the Miami Police Force. I'll be back. You, you, something wrong with you. They don't follow the rules. You, you ain't with the bad guys now. You with, you with the cops. They make them. Sir. Quietly. You forgot your boarding pass. Oh, shit. Bad boys, bad boys. What, what you, you gonna, gonna do? do? What you, you gonna, gonna do when they come for you? Uh, uh, bad boy. Uh, uh, you know, you drive almost slow enough to drive Miss Daisy. Yeah.